Welcome and thank you so much for joining me for Mandala Unplugged Part 2. It has been so much fun to watch the mandalas emerge from all over the globe. These images here are from um, the Facebook group Mandala Unplugged, which of course you're more than welcome to join. At the upper left, we've got Deb, who has a green background, and she decided to use a multicolor yarn to crochet her leaves, which looks absolutely beautiful. On the upper right, we've got Kim, who used an upcycled velvet curtain to cut her leaves from, and that is such a great idea and what a great use for that. Super luscious. And then as you can see in the middle picture, Sarah used a silk that uh, her parents brought her back from Thailand, which is such a beautiful piece of cloth. And she used tone on tone um, so that we're seeing not a pop of color, but a pop of texture. And I cannot wait to see what color beads she decides to put around these leaves. So thank you for sharing that, Sarah. It's beautiful. And then the bottom two pictures are from Debbie and Kathleen, who both used ultra suede. And you know, I forgot all about ultra suede. In the first video when I was mentioning what you could use instead of crocheting, I mentioned wool, which is an awesome option. But ultra suede is equally as great because you don't have to turn the edges of ultra suede. You can cut your piece right out of that fabric and stitch it directly onto your piece without any edges fraying. And you're left with a nice clean edge. Um, so that is a fantastic fabric. Thank you so much for sharing. See, I'm just learning as much from you guys um, just by sharing pictures and commenting. You know, the questions that you guys have and that, that you post publicly is so great because not only does it help other people, but it helps me know what it is out there that I can help with that, that I forgot to mention or, you know, that, that maybe I needed to elaborate more on. So I really appreciate that. So keep your pictures coming and keep your comments and questions coming. I'm right here to answer them and we can all learn from each other. You know, and that's the best thing about being a part of a stitch along is that we can share our images, our techniques and our ideas and our color combinations. And that is, there's no greater benefit to a stitch along than that. So, um, so please keep those coming and join the Facebook page and let's just all stay connected. So today we're going to stitch beads onto the upper part of the leaves. At the base of those leaves we're going to work two layers of applique and I'm going to show you how to turn those edges before you put them on your piece. We're going to use starch, freezer paper, and a mini iron to do that. Now for a more comprehensive guide on turned applique, I do have a video that I did last year that you can look for um, and watch if you need a little bit more guidance. But um, for this particular time we are going to turn our edges with the freezer paper method. Um, you don't have to turn your edges. Of course you can use raw edge applique, which we are going to be doing more later on in this piece. Okay. You know, a raw edge applique is just as beautiful, but it does remain flat on the piece. In this case, um, for today, I wanted to do turned raised applique just because, um, you know, it, it's going to be raised up off of the, the crochet leaves and it's, you know, it's really not that difficult. So I encourage you to try. Um, but again, it's your piece, you do whatever you want to. And then the other thing that we're going to do is um, continue to mark the background and stitch on the background. So we're going to get a little bit more stitching done on that. Go ahead and grab the thread that you originally used to make your stitches and here's what else you're going to need for today. So for the beading um, section, which is what we're going to start with, you're going to need your size 8 seed beads or really any beads. You're not limited to that, but just keep in mind scale. So you could do size six seed beads, but I wouldn't do as many because they're bigger. Um, you could do Delicas, you could do Bugles, anything you want to. We're basically working around this sort of edge of the leaf. Um, for those of you who have a kit, this is going to be your seed bead uh, number letter D. And let's see, now as far as beading needles, this is a true beading needle. This is from John James. It's a a, either a 12 or a 14. I'm not sure. I don't know the differences between the two of them. I can't really tell. Um, that's got a tiny little eye. But you know, honestly, in a quilt with this, you could use just a, this, a tiny little needle, something with an eye big enough to hold the thread, but needle small enough to work through the beads. And you know, as you can see, these size 8 beads have nice big holes, so there's no problem using a regular sewing needle if you don't have a beading needle. I know I mentioned the Nemo thread, and this is so great, but I didn't mention the color. 
When you're doing beading, this is a little bit opposite than applique. When you're appliqueing, you want to match your thread to the applique piece, but when you're beading, you want to match your thread to the background piece. So here I've got this white. If you know the beads are going to be kind of half on the leaf and half off, I could use that. I could use this sort of darker brown. Um, this is upholstery thread that I got at um, Joann's at the craft store. This is a great option as well. And this is ancient poly thread that we probably all have in our um, in our stash. So you could use any of these. Cotton would be okay if you have a really strong cotton. The only thing that I would be wary of is that whatever bead that you're using, inside there could be some rough edges and it could fray your cotton. So that's why I like to stick with poly or some sort of coated cotton or upholstery thread or something really strong, beading thread, whatever. But you don't have to run right out and get this if you don't have Nemo. You can, like I said, you can just use polyester thread, that's fine. So that's for the beading. For turn to applique, you're gonna need a couple of things. Um, the first thing that you're gonna wanna make sure that you have is some sort of starch or starch, starch alternative. This is Mary Ellen's Best Press, you can get it at most quilt stores, some craft shops, it smells amazing. The alternative to that is this flatter spray that I learned about from my friend Alex Anderson. And thank goodness she clued me in on this because this stuff smells incredible. If you think Best Press smells good, this stuff is amazing. Um, or a lot of people use just good old starch, Niagara starch, it's totally fine. If you're going to use this, you're gonna to wanna to spray a bunch of this into the cap because we're gonna be dipping um, our uh, little paintbrush into the starch to brush it onto those edges. Okay, and you're gonna need a little bit of freezer paper, just the normal freezer paper you can get at any grocery store, and our hair marker, our trusty hair marker, because this is what we're gonna to use to actually turn um, the edge. We're going to use the iron to turn the edge, but we're going to use this to stabilize the piece. And this has that great edge that you can fold fabric onto. So the hair edge, hair marker is my favorite turning tool when I'm using starch. If you have a kit from me, you'll be looking at your um, fabrics B and C, or if you're just looking at the materials list, go ahead and look at B and C and just see how much you need. Um, it's not very much of each one, so definitely go dig through your stash. I'm sure you'll have something. Okay, B and C of the template, which you can download from my website, along with the materials list if you're just getting started, which incidentally, if you are just getting started, the first part only takes a day or two to do, so you're not that far behind. So go to annemyrequilts.com and download the materials list and these templates. All right, and then an iron. Now I've got the clover iron that is on a stick, but unfortunately it's totally filthy and it needs to be replaced. So I won't put you through that during the dura duration of the demonstration because it's really nasty. Um, so I have this little guy, super cute. My husband makes fun of me. He says it looks like I'm playing house when I use it, but I don't care, I love it. Um, some scissors, of course. And then you'll want to find some very thin cotton to match your applique uh, color choices. So this is Aurifil. I love this stuff. It's super strong. It's a 50 weight two ply thread. So it's really skinny and hard to see. What you're going to want to do is just get the closest match you can and air on the side of a little bit darker so it looks like it's in a shadow. And then of course just any needle, you know, a little tiny needle that we're going to applique on. Same needle that you could even use for your beading. Um, and I think that's it for the applique. Oh, and an acrylic synthetic flathead paintbrush that you can dedicate for your starch um, edges. And then the only other thing you might want to do is your pressing surface. You may want to have a pillowcase or some sort of cover because we're going to be using quite a bit of starch and you want to protect your ironing or your pressing surface. And then of course for marking the background we're going to use our original tools, the thread, the needle, we're going to use the hair marker to mark. And how we're going to do that is if you have a you know, quilter's template plastic or if you just have a page protector, this is what we're going to use to draw the lines that we're going to need. Use that as our template and then we're going to cut that out of like cardboard or something else that we can use that we can edge our hair marker against. And of course we'll go through more of that when, it's, when, we, when we stitch the background. But we're going to go ahead and start with the beads. So the end of the thread is normally the end that should be threaded. And how you can tell, let's cut off a piece here. 
let's just say you know, 18 inches or so. And I'm using that upholstery thread. I decided not even to use, I like the color match, and so I'm going to use that rather than even the Nemo. But how you can tell is that if you run your hand down the length of the thread, one way should feel smooth and one way should feel rough. If you thread the rough end, which is the thread that I just cut from, what's going to happen is you're going to have a little bit more tangles and shredding because you're going against the grain of the twist. So make sure that you run your hand along whatever thread that you're using and the side that's smooth, the top part of the thread that's smooth is the is the part that you're going to want to thread onto your needle. I've showed you this before, but this is that quilter's knot holding the end. One, two, three. Pop the end in your thumb and your first finger and pull. And then you've got that great knot. If there's any F left over, you can just cut it. Now, if you're still trying to keep the back neat, what you could do is come through underneath the leaf and not even go through the back at all. So let's try that. And we'll exit right out the tippy top point of that leaf. I can still see my knot, so I'm gonna pull it a little bit. You hear that click? And now that knot is buried underneath there. And for the rest of this time, you don't have to go through all the way to the back when you're beading. You can just stick with the top and just work through some of the batting. I want that bead to stand up a little bit. So I'm going to go through the bead again. Let's try and get this a little closer for you. And I'm just underneath that bead and that secure place. And you could do every bead. You can run it through twice. That'll keep it even more secure. Now the rest of the beads, we, we said 17 beads per each leaf. So we've got one, which means we're going to need eight down this side and eight down now this side. Now if you didn't crochet and you've got a flat piece, you can use your stitches that you used along there or just evenly space them down. Um, start at the top and just work the eight stitches down and then on the other side make sure that they are directly across from each other ending about there about two-thirds of the way because our applique is going to go right here so that's why we're not doing any beads underneath here. So for those of you who crocheted what we're going to do is put the needle into the top part of the stitch, pick up a bead and then just pop that needle. It's almost like completing a circle you know you're going from underneath and coming up again. Okay, and that bead is going to want to rest so that the hole is up, which I really like. So I'm going to go into the bead again under that same stitch. And up. And then that bead just lays there with the hole facing up. And you can see why you want to match either your background or in this case your leaf. Um, so now we can go into the bead again and then come up in the top of the next stitch. Make sure you're not through your thread there. Grab a bead. And complete that circle. So you're going to go from underneath And we're just in the top of that stitch. All right, so back down into the bead. And you can catch a little bit of the background if you want to, that's fine. Okay, back into the bead. Now we're going to go into the next one. So let's move our thread back here so we don't get caught up in that. So into the bead and up through that next stitch, this little neighbor there, pick up a bead 
And again, let's just make that little circle. So you're just gonna go from underneath, catch a little bit of the background. That gives it a little bit more stability. Okay, into the bead again. Up through the same stitch, make it really stable. Okay, and then down into the bead. So we're already in that stitch, so we we'll want to come up here. A little too far, there we go. Grab a bead. Complete that circle. So you're going from underneath and coming up, catching that bead right on the side. Into the bead. Up through the same hole. Next stitch, go down into the bead. Then come up in that next stitch. All right. So what we'll have is your top bead and then eight stitches, eight, eight beads coming down to about there, and eight beads on this side that match, so this will all be left blank. So, so here's what mine looks like all beaded, and as you can see, I didn't choose a bead that contrasted with the leaves, but that uh, more coordinates with it, and I really love the outline of it. You know, you've got the shiny against the matte, and it almost just sort of defines that leaf and keeps those edges even more crisp than they were before. So let's move on to the applique. So these drawn out shapes represent the actual size of the piece without seam allowance. So we'll be building the seam allowance in when we trace or when we um, press the template to the fabric. But first we've got to make our template. So what you do is you take a piece of freezer paper and just lay it. since. You know, we can lay this paper side up since this is a, a, a mirror image. It doesn't matter if this is reversed, so we can just use the paper side. You can take a Sharpie or a pencil or whatever you have. This does not matter because it's not going to transfer to your fabric. And just trace the outline of the template. All right. Um, and you can mark them if you want to. Obviously, it's pretty obvious there are two different shapes. So, once you have those, you're going to cut them out of your freezer paper. And then, to make an even stronger template, what we're going to do is iron paper side up on both of these. You never want to touch your iron to the waxy side of the freezer paper, obviously, because you'll have a mess. All right, and then cut it out again, and that way you have a little bit of a stronger template to turn your edges under. Some people will go even further. They'll do a three or four layer template. Um, I like two because the heat will still penetrate through both layers. You know, the more paper you have, the, the less the heat will go through those, so the less it'll stick. So I like a two layer freezer template, but of course that's personal preference. So these templates should last you for all eight pieces of the applique. You can use freezer paper over and over again, so it's really great. Let's say you are drawing out your own design. You know, you, you want to just kind of make this whole thing your own, which is awesome, just totally great. So you would just, this is free, directly on freezer paper I do this. So maybe you want something that flares a little more. So you draw this shape out and you can imagine how impossible it would be to get both sides, of course, the same. So what I do is I'll draw a line up the middle. I decide which side I like better. I think I like this side better. So then I would just fold it in half. and cut along the side that I like better. 
and then there's my mirror image template. And then it doesn't really matter what marks are on here because you've just got the template that's mirror image, okay? So that's just if you wanna design your own, that's how I design everything. I just draw a shape and I pick the side I like and I fold it in half and I cut it out and that's my shape. And it's super easy and super fast. So you don't even have to be stressing out about making both sides match. All right, so now once you have your shapes, let's go ahead and deal with B first. That's the easiest one. You've got your B fabric. This is the one that is going to directly lay right over the crochet leaf. It's just going to there's just going to be a little point peeking out. Make sure that the wrong side is facing up. If you have, you know, a, a batik or a, a shot cotton, then you don't have to worry about that. But if you have a print or something that has both sides, make sure the wrong side is facing up. And really, what the best thing to do, since we are going to ask this fabric to bend itself on a curve, is go ahead and align that freezer paper template up on the diagonal of the grain. And that way, it'll turn just a little bit easier. All right, so freezer paper, shiny side down, paper side up, wrong side up. Just give it a little press. And if you have serrated scissors, that is helpful in maintaining and controlling the fray that can happen on cottons. If you're using something other than cotton here, let's say you've got silk or you've got radiance that you want to use, be mindful. I would suggest going back to my video on applique because you're going to want to glue this and use interfacing to keep the template in only because the starch will stain silk and it stains radiance. So this works really well if you're using cotton. If you're using silk, go to that video and just do the template method, not the freezer paper method. All right, and then just give it another press if it, if it pops off. So we need to fold these edges under. Only one side of the point needs to be pointy. This bottom part is going to be buried underneath this, so you don't have to stress about folding both sides under. We're just going to focus on one. So let me show you how to do that. What you're going to do, I've got my little espresso cup full of starch here, and you're going to brush your starch or starch alternative or whatever it is that you want to do along the sides. You take your Hera marker or whatever turning marker, you know, you can use whatever it is that you've got a sharp edge. Gosh, even a butter knife might even work. Who knows? And your little tiny iron, starting at the center, just press that down. Now, when you're wanting to go along the curve, you see how I'm using the iron just along the paper side and that will maintain the curve. You know, you're not going to just whoosh like this because that's how you'll get little, um, you know, points. So make sure that the iron is brushing right along that paper, then you can just give it a nice press. Of course you can use, if you don't have a mini iron, you can use a big iron for this. Um, obviously the only trouble with that is it's so cumbersome. So. Um, you know, a mini iron is, is just a little bit more easy to manage. Okay, and you're going to flip it around. Brush those sides again. Starting at the outermost part of your curve and then this will overlap that's fine that's what you want you want that little tag sticking out there press that down had to adjust the lighting a little bit. My camera was doing some weird, funky halo thing. Probably because I have this dark background, who knows. But hopefully you can still see what I'm doing. So here you've got your piece. The template is still in there, obviously. Um, 
one, only one of these sides we have to address because that's the side that's going to be poking out. So all you're going to do here is fold that little flag so that the fold lines up very close, almost even with the side of your um, folded edge of your applique. Can you kind of see that? Which may or may not, depending on how much fabric you had in your seam allowance, end up with an additional flag. No biggie, you're just gonna fold that under two and it'll be kind of like accordion folding. When you press it in place, it sets those lines so that you've got a, a nice, easy um, fold line that you know you're gonna be following when you stitch, all right? And then this bottom part, again, we said, that's going to be buried underneath the other applique piece so we can just snip that off. You never want to snip off the point because all you're going to do is make trouble for yourself. This will start to fray and you're going to end up having to really worry about that. Even though this makes a lumpier fold, the accordion is better because you don't have raw edges to worry about. So that piece is done. Okay, That goes out and you just set it aside. Okay, so that's piece B. Now piece C has some other things that we need to worry about. We've got a little point in here. So again, wrong side of the fabric facing up, paper side of the template facing up, and press. When you're pressing your templates, let's say you um, don't, you know, I normally wouldn't cut a little square. I would just put them right onto the big piece of the fabric. But make sure that you've got a fourth of an inch around the template to be able to cut around. Okay, so don't forget that because remember we're building our seam allowance. And, you know, this is an eyed up quarter of an inch because we're folding it under, so it doesn't really matter if it's an exact quarter of an inch like it does in piecing. And just cut the outline of the shape out again with your quarter of an inch seam allowance like we did with piece B. What we have to do here is we've got to clip this line so that we can fold this piece here and this piece here. You don't want to clip all the way to the paper because you're going to have some you know frayed edges that you're going to have to deal with but the idea is to just clip it so that we can split that little um, crevice there. And even before I put starch on, what I do is I just take my fingernail and I run it the, the, along the edge of the freezer paper and just kind of press that V down. That'll just help when you go to fold your edge under. So we're going to deal with the hard stuff first and then easily come back around. Now every edge of this has to be folded under because this entire applique piece will show. So we've got to deal with all of the points, which is not hard. It's the same exact thing as we did with B. Um, as far as fabric choices, this is a shot cotton so it's very simple to work with because it's so thin, the, the weave is so loose. So if you're using a really heavy cotton, you may have a more difficult time folding the center. So just keep that in mind in fabric selection for applique. Now you've noticed that I'm doing the upper part of the point first. That is so that I can establish that curve before I take the iron down into the V. So once I've got the curve established here and the curve established here, I can just take that iron, okay, and you'll, you'll fray a little bit here, so w this is the benefit of that starch. Let's put a little bit more starch on there, keep him in place. Run your finger around and then just press it with your iron. And then when you flip it over, you know, you've got that great point. You can press it from that side too. Press your starch. And again, I always start with the outer point of that curve and then just work in both directions. And again, once you flap that curve under, 
You're going to have a little flap, which is what you want. Tiny bites right along the edge of the freezer paper. Use the end of the hair marker too. Let's say I got I got a little bit of a crease in there that I didn't really want, so you can use that point to sort of manipulate the fabric, which is really great. There's a tiny little bump there. Run your fingernail along there. It smooths it out. Kind of helps. Not a big deal. We can wor worry about that too when we're stitching it down. Flip it over, we'll deal with that corner. Just accordion fold that down and give it a just a good tight press with your fingers. Same here, folding this down and that down. Folding the edges before you actually stitch the applique down is in lieu of what's called needle turn applique. In needle turn applique, you would have your shape with all of your seam allowances and you would fold it down with your needle. Some people are amazing at that. Um, I just, this is just the way I prefer to do it because I love relaxing hand stitching and needle turn is not relaxing for me at all. So now that you've got your two pieces, let's look at these on top of the mandala that we have so far and see where, you know, where we're going to sew this on, how much is going to peek out, and where this is exactly going to go onto your piece. Next week, we're going to work um, some embroidery in here. So we want to leave enough room to really make some fun stuff happen because that's when this mandala will start to sing. So what we want to make sure is that we measure one inch from the center and that's where the base of this is going to sit. Okay, so while we're playing around with, um, you know, these two pieces, let's just pop a pin in there. And that way we know that that's where that's going to go. So if that's going to sit here, like this, this piece, make sure that the accordion point is up will sit in here. And then it's up to you to decide you know, how much you want this to cover what you've done thus far. So what I'm doing, it's actually kind of perfect. This little guy, if you flip it over, nestles right in here. And there's really not too much overlapping here. You know, I've got my, my piece B and the point of that just sort of nestles right in here. And, and I'm, I'm happy with that. So what I'm going to do is pin these two pieces together. And that way it's a unit. Take your threaded needle. Come up from behind B. And exit the needle right on the very edge, the fold of piece C. I find it's a little bit more difficult to work with this pin. So now that I've got that stitched in place, I'm going to remove the pin. Directly below where the thread is coming out on C, you're going to pierce the fabric in B and then come up again right at the fold line of C. This is about a sixteenth of an inch away. Pull slowly, otherwise your thread's just going to get caught on everything. So you're down on B, and you're coming right up again through C. So make sure that your needle is inserting in B just below itself. You're not moving it over here, otherwise you're going to see a slanted thread here. So again, you're coming right straight down. And about a sixteenth of an inch away, you're coming up through B and exiting the needle out of the fold of C. Since we took the pin out, make sure that that is still lined up, centered, and how you want it. Go down at B, and then what you're going to do is come up just at the point of C. Slowly. Let's go down at the point and come right up again just to get that extra little thread wrap in there just to lock those any fray 
threads that think about coming out, we'll get them locked into place. And then just work right up the other side, down into B, up through the fold of C, pull slow, <laughs> down through B, up through B and the fold of C, through B and then right at the right out of the fold of B and C and then leaving the thread on the needle and the needle on the applique piece now we can continue to sew this onto the piece alrighty we have got our pin marking where we want the base leaving that one inch there make sure we center this onto the leaf and it's okay for covering a couple of beads there, it doesn't really matter. We know they're there. Pin this in place. Take out this pin, you don't need that right now. Okay, so to stitch this down, just move that little flag over onto the side that we're not stitching yet. And I am covering a bead here, so if you are too, that's okay, no biggie. Just go down into the leaf and the, the most important thing is that you're coming out the fold of the piece of the applique that you're stitching on. And then the same kind of rules apply. You're going right directly down into the fabric. And don't go all the way to the back. Just into the fabric, maybe take a little piece of the batting and you're good. Down into the back of the fabric. Let's see if I get the light here. and come up right out of the point. Tuck that in. And you can use your needle to swoop that under. Hold it with your thumb. And then take an extra stitch here at the point, just right underneath it, and come out the point again. And that will really nail that point down into the background. So then when you come back down the other side, just make sure that you're, you know, kind of turning this getting that little extra fabric underneath, go right down into the point behind again, and then come up. Now rather than just come up into the fabric in one swoop, what I'll do is I'll make sure that I'm not in any part of that, um, that extra flap, that fabric, that tail that's underneath there, because that's really easy to pierce and then bring up to the front. You're on the fold, but you're almost underneath the applique on the fold. It might take a couple tries, a couple stabs to get it right. Right underneath. Okay, so I'm at a point again. So let's just go through that again. Make sure all of the extra fabric is along the side that you're not stitching. And then of course the point you would want to line right up with your background stitching that you've done. So into the fabric and right out the point. This around a little bit. And to reiterate that point, into the background, up through the point. And at this point what I do is I just take my fingernail and I just scoop that underneath. your needle, whatever is helpful to you, and then go back up the other side. The first time being go down, up, and then go into the fold of your fabric, making sure you're not taking any of the background piece with you. All right, so as you reach the other point up here, it's safe to take the pin out. Make sure all of the point of your, um, all that extra fabric underneath is on the side that you're not stitching right now. And make sure, just visualize it, eye it up and make sure that it's, you know, as far away from the leaf as this point here. 
you know you want it to be obviously as symmetrical as possible there's gonna be so much going on so don't go like really nuts trying to measure you know I wouldn't pull out a ruler at this point or anything just eye it up and make sure it's gonna be pretty similar um, you know in other words you don't want this like way out here or your fingernail or whatever it is that you can use to make that easier and then start make sure you don't have any of the background and then come up just in the front and then you'll be right at the point where you started right where the upper K piece B meets C that little bead over there and then we just stitched this down the same way and you really don't even have to go through the background fabric, just the leaf. Make sure the point is lined up with the spine of your leaf, or the center I should say, kind of pointing right up to that top bead. For me it's almost easier if I use my fingernail than my needle. Up through and then lay the needle on and bury that extra fabric and just come up through the front. Alright, so now before you cut everything, make sure you just look at everything. Make sure you like the way that it's lying. Um, if you know if some of these beads want to come over naturally, that's fine. Um, that's pretty. This is a great way to practice your stitching or applique because we're going to do so much along the sides of it that it you know you don't have to go really cuckoo about it being perfect. Um, so at this point, when that applique is done, just push the needle all the way to the back. Make sure you're not going over any beads. And then let's end it. A tiny bite of fabric. One, two, three. While you're stitching your applique on top of your leaves, just be mindful as you can of the spacing in between them. Obviously, we are human, we are not robots. It's not going to be absolutely perfect. It's really easy to scrutinize every little detail, but really what we're going for is, again, it's symmetry, which we have. So, um, you know, it's okay if this, this is a little closer together than, let's say, over here. You know, we're trying to get as close as we can. Um, and we are going to be adding so much embroidery and things in here that it, you know, every little detail is not going to matter. Just think of nature and flowers. No flower is identical to the next one. So, um, so don't try, try not to be such a perfectionist when it comes to this stuff. You know, always measure your inch away here and be mindful of the spaces and just get as close as you can. It's going to be beautiful. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to draw lines in between each of these lines that stretch out to five and a half. You know, lie this on the table, try to center that as best you can, and then at the five and a half inch mark, just pop a little pin in there. All right? What we're looking for here is the same distance between this line and this line and this line and this line, making sure that you know, this entry point is about two and an eighth. And then when you measure on the diagonal, make sure that you're running the ruler along the diagonal and see where you end up with. And that's, that's pretty close. I'm happy with that. And if I look again, I'm going to see that line pretty much will fall right into the center. All right, and then just turn it. Before you mark it with your hair marker, we're going to go ahead and just place all of the pins and make sure we're really happy with the placement. So again, I've got my ruler here. I'm trying to find eye up that center place right here. Five and a half, pop in a pin. And let's measure that and see how that one looks. So as I'm laying my ruler on the diagonal, I'm at... two and an eighth. 
And as I lay the ruler on the straight, I am at two and an eighth. So it looks like two and the eighth is my number and should be yours as well. For extra good measure, go ahead and measure be the point between the two dots. And we should be at about four and a quarter, which we're close. You know, when you look at the entry part right there, we're four and a quarter. So it should be four and a quarter all the way around. So let's do the next one and see how well we did here. All right, that goes in the center. Looking at my center point between these two, pop that pan in at five and a half. Pretty close to two and an eighth. Again, making sure that my ruler, that my, my lines are lining up with this line that I stitched. Pretty close to two and an eighth. Measure those two guys out and we're at four and a quarter, really close. Close enough for the eye, and that's what we're going for. So all the way around, go ahead and pop your pin in each uh, place in between. You'll have eight of them. All right, so once you have all eight of your sections marked and you have embraced how beautiful your mandala is thus far, the next check is to take a bigger ruler and lay it directly across from one pin head to the next and see that the cross is going to be right there in the center. And once you're ensured that it's going to go through, you start at this pin here and make your Hera marker line there. That's our next stitching line. We're going to stitch along that line up to those two pin points right here. Now, uh, this is another, uh, this is a good time to mention too that you may have to continue to mark, you know, these lines as we work them. You may, with your hands, just ease them out and that's okay. We don't have to do that quite yet just because we're not going to be working out here until um, maybe in the next couple weeks. So don't worry about that now. Just heads up, you, you may have to remark those lines and that's fine. All right, so we're going to draw four of those cross lines from one pin to the next. So just as you did in part one of the video, you're going to start in the center, stitch up to here, start in the center, stitch up to the pin, take the pins out as you go, and then you'll have these radiating lines, and then we can take from here, we're going to make little arcs down to here, like so. Alrighty, so once you have all of your eight um, line stitched out and stopping at five and a half inches. Then we can draw our line from here to here. And what that's going to do is that's going to give us a place to put the Oya on. Um, the Oya we'll do in a couple weeks. That is the crocheting with beads, the Turkish edging. Um, our knit leaves will lie right on top of here. And all of these lines will be covered with applique and embroidery. But the nice thing is, is now we've at least got a, a guideline in our little landscape. And that's why we drew those lines. And it also further quilts the piece. And really what we're going for here is not so much a specific line, but the same line all the way around. So all you're gonna do is put that file folder or a quilter's template or whatever it is that you've got that's clear Draw the center line, just trace that, just so you have that line. And then freehand draw a line from the top of your leaf to there. It could be taller than mine, it could be a little shorter, it doesn't really matter. All that matters is that on your piece, you are going to have symmetry. So let's just go ahead now and cut this piece out and we're going to trace it onto cardboard and that's going to be our line that we're going to use our hair marker to mark. So let me cut this out real quick. Okay, and then this is just the back of a legal pad. You just draw, just trace that line. Oops. Trace the straight line too so you know what edge that's the edge you'll put on your stitching line and then maybe just here 
this doesn't ma really matter. Okay, get rid of that guy. And then cut this out. And now what you would do is you would, let's make sure before you do your hair marker that we do in fact have a five and a half inch line. So my stitching stopped just short, which is okay. That's going to get covered, so it's not a big deal. But I want my, I want to make sure that my um, arc starts right here and ends at the top of that leaf. And then just mark your line. And then obviously just reverse it. Make sure it's at the top of that leaf. And don't worry so much if you know this this is coming down a little bit on the leaf. That's okay. We're just looking for that symmetrical arc that we're gonna stitch on, alright? So there you go. So when you do that from the top of the leaf to the top of the line you just stitched, then back down to the next leaf, then what you're going to do is stitch this line all the way around eight times. Okay. So draw that out eight times, so it's going from the top of the leaf to the top of the stitching, back down to the top of the next leaf, go ahead and stitch it, and then mark the next one. Um, that way you won't uh, rub out the crease that you've just made. So that's what I would do. Mark your line, stitch it, mark your line, stitch it. And then we'll come back and look at it and talk about next week. Okay, so once you have all of those arcs stitched out, what you'll have is sort of this um, mandala looking um, background, which is really cool. Now again, don't be too fussy and don't look too close here. You know, as long as you've got your your five and a half inches out from the center and you've got this arc here on each on each line, um, you're great. We're gonna cover all of that up with our with our leaves and our embroidery and the Oya. So this again is just a, a line to follow for the fun stuff that we're gonna lay um, next week, which brings me to what you'll need. We'll be doing all the embroidery that's gonna go in the center and in between the leaves. Uh, we're also going to work on knitting the oak leaves, which look like this. I've done one here for you. Okay, and these go above every leaf. So that's sort of the shape, but we'll give more measurements next week. So what you'll want to gather is some sock weight yarn again. This time, why don't we choose a wool or a poly, something with memory in it so that there are not holes except for the ones that we plan to be. There's, it's kind of a lace pattern, if you can see. You know, those are with the yarn over. So it's more of an intermediate knitting um, pattern, but we'll go through it really slow. So I encourage you to give it a try, and I do have a beginning knitting um, video out there, so you can look at that if you've never knit before. A few embroidery threads. If you bought a kit, you've got this. We will for sure be using A. We'll be using um, E and F, which are um, flosses. So if you look at your materials list, if you don't have a kit, just get just gather all of your threads in colors that you like, that you think will coordinate with your mandala so far. And then a couple colors of four millimeter silk ribbon. Um, this is Trinway Silks ribbon. You could get it on Amazon. They have one, a one called um, Thread Nanny that I really like. It comes on spools. Um, but again, it's either three and a half or four millimeter silk ribbon and you'll need two colors. So that's it for this week. I hope you've had fun. I hope that you uh, enjoy this part of the mandala. Please, again, let me know um, if you have any questions at all. And please keep sharing your pictures on Facebook. I love to see them. I'll be standing by to answer anything that you have and to watch your progress. So happy stitching and happy week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you so much.